Thank you all for coming out. Thanks to many of you for coming out a second time on this topic. We really appreciate you being here and being engaged as we move through the community engagement process around the redevelopment of Brooklyn Village. My name is Dennis LaCaria. I'm the senior assistant to the county manager. No, this microphone is not connected to an amplifier, so if you can't hear and you want to move up front, please by all means do so. This is to capture the audio because we are recording this and we will be replaying this on our website going forward so that any time throughout the process if anybody wants to go back and review the meeting see what was said <clears throat> see who was there you can go to our website and you'll be able to watch the raw unedited footage from each one of the meetings including last night's so we expect to have those up in the next couple of days so check back if, if you don't see it when you first when you first go back so as we move through today we will have opportunity for questions and answers and people to share some of their recollections. We'll ask everybody to wait until the microphone comes to you. And if you don't mind saying your name so that it's captured for the purposes of the video and that we can um, make sure that we're attributing the questions, the, co the quotes and the comments appropriately. We are very, very, very excited about this opportunity. We're very, very gratified by the fact that so many people care and are engaged and are involved. Thank you again for being here. We have, among other folks you'll hear from today, Don Peebles, who's the chairman and CEO of the Peebles Corporation, and Monty Ritchie, who's president of the Conformity Corporation, who are leading the team that we are partnering with to redevelop Brooklyn Village. And with that, I will turn this over to Monty Ritchie. So thank you all for being here uh, today. I'll uh, reiterate what uh, Dennis has said. Certain of you are here for a second time. I want to recognize Ms. Ely for being here again today, so thank you for that. Um, and for those of you who are with us for the first time today, I appreciate you coming out. We're going to be talking um, about history, culture, and design today. We'll get into that in a little more detail here in just a minute. Uh, I want to recognize County Manager Dina DiOrio and um, Deputy County Manager Chris Peake, who's with us in the back. Thank you very much for, for being with us today. Um, history, culture, and design, you know, difficult topics, right? We, we've, uh, and you're, you're going to hear a lot about that this morning. Uh, I think everybody has a, uh, at least a shorthand knowledge of the history of uh, Brooklyn. We're going to go into that a little more deeply today. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, designs that Stantec has helped put together, uh, helped us put together over the past several months. I want to recognize uh, Craig Lewis and Jeffrey Simon, who are here uh, with us from Stantec today. If you guys will wave your hands around a, a little bit. Thank you. And um, we also have uh, a few other designers with us from Perkins and Will and, and from uh, Cole Genest and Stone, both of whom have been uh, uh, instrumental in helping us get to, uh, get to this place. Um, the culture topic, I think, is the one that is uh, that we're we're really dialed in on. Um, we uh, we want to be sure to focus as much as we can today on on these questions. When we get to Q and A, you'll see these again. Uh, you should have received a handout in your package that uh, gives you the opportunity to write in some information uh, in response to these questions. Uh, they will. Uh, uh, you also have an opportunity to talk about them actively during the Q&A. And our website is up now as well, which we'll share at the end of the presentation. The website's always available for you to go and deposit your thoughts on just about anything uh, related uh, to Brooklyn, and we'll be taking up all that feedback as we uh, consider how to uh, best adapt our plan and evolve our plan around uh, the feedback that we're getting from folks who are attending these meetings. Conformity Corp is uh, quickly an infill company, been in Charlotte uh, developing since 1993. Uh, I am not a Charlotte native, but I've been here for 25 years. Uh, I met my wife here, my kids were born here. So uh, I'm going to claim um, adopted native status, maybe. Uh, certainly my family, uh, my kids are Southerners. And uh, the town's been very good to, uh, to, to me and to uh, my company. And uh, we hope to continue doing great work here, including in uh, Brooklyn. And I thank, again, the folks who early on opened their door to me and other folks from Conformity Corp uh, when we were first working on pursuing this project. 
Before I had the opportunity to uh, meet uh, Don Peebles, who's the chairman and CEO of the uh, Peebles Corporation, Jeffrey and uh, Craig were responsible for making that happen, so thanks to both of them for making the introduction. I'm going to introduce Don now, chairman and CEO of the Peebles Corporation, my partner in BK Partners. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. Good to see some familiar faces, um, and uh, um, we're happy to be here. Uh, before I begin, I want to also uh, uh, introduce a few members of our team. Uh, Greg Cola, who is our director of investments uh, for our company nationally, and uh, he's in charge of uh, underwriting our deals and also helping us find the financing to pay for them. So a very uh, critical aspect of our team, and appreciate him being here. Um, because of the history and the future um, of this project and the importance of it, my children are here as well. My daughter, who's 13, um, who will be a uh, college graduate, hopefully, by the time we round up finishing up this development. And uh, so hopefully she'll be a part of it as we go on. And then um, our, my son, who is also an executive of the company, uh, Donahue Peebles III, is here as well. Um, our company, I'll give you a brief Reader's Digest of our company. Um, our company, the Peebles Corporation, uh, was founded in 1983 by me um, when I was 23. Um, we started developing in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, our first building was a public-private partnership, by the way, um, designed to revitalize an economically neglected community that had been destroyed by urban renewal and the riots of 68, and called Anacostia. Um, and so many characteristics are very similar uh, to Brooklyn Village. And, uh, and that um, project, uh, we developed that and delivered it in 1989. That kick-started a revitalization of Anacostia, which continues today and is one of the most vibrant parts of Washington, D.C., culturally and ethnically diverse um, in terms of its residents and its businesses. And, uh, and so fast forward today, our company is a multi-billion dollar business, um, and we do projects from Miami. Uh, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, the scale of our projects has grown. So from $10 million in uh, 1989 to today, um, we're building a $550 million development in New York City. Um, throughout our company's history, we have focused on equal access to opportunity. So we are committed to equal economic opportunity. Um, for those who have had fewer opportunities. So our focus has been on African-American owned businesses and women owned businesses and to provide access to opportunities for those two groups of people who have um, uh, seen fewer opportunities. And I have a deep history in that. My mother um, exposed me to real estate. She had me at 19 years old, exposed me to real estate. Um, and so as an African-American woman, um, I saw her face and confront many challenges. She was a single parent raising me and so the core of our business is very sensitive to that issue. And so one of the things I want to assure you is that when we say 35% economic opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses, we mean it. Um, we have done that throughout our projects in some capacity, whether it be 20 25%, or 50%, but we continue to do that, and that's critical to us. Um, I'm here because um, we like Charlotte, and I'm inspired by the leadership of the county, um, especially the county manager and her team. Um, but also, this is a critical project. This is some, uh, the Brooklyn Village meant so much to so many people, not just in Charlotte, but those who grew up and lived in Brooklyn Village, you know, went around the country, moved around the country. And so this is very important, the history of Brooklyn Village is, and also the Second Ward High School, um, which closed when I was nine years old. And so um, because of that, this is a project that is more than just a real estate development project. This is a project that is going to create economic opportunities, going to enhance a cultural experience, be a place for all residents of Charlotte to gather, live, and work, and, and have opportunity. And it was for those reasons um, and the history of Brooklyn Village that our company is here today, because we were attracted by that. And I'm grateful for Jeff Simon um, of Stantec, to, who put us together. Jeff and I met in Boston, and he put Monty and I together. And I think that our partnership also reflects the type of development that we want to develop, but outstanding local knowledge and expertise um, that uh, Conformity has and our company's national platform and national experience. Also the diversity of our experiences. Well, Monty and I have a lot in common. Um, both of us quit college, both of us started our own businesses and we built it from the ground up with our own sweat, and blood and tears um, and, uh, and commitment to um, equality 
and also, but we come from different perspectives of life. And so what we have, and that's what Charlotte is. And so I think our unity and our, our, our partnership um, sets a tone for the type of development that we want to develop. And so we are embarking on um, a partnership with you and the community. The county laid out a vision, so of course, and they're the landowner, and they uh, laid out the vision, so they are partner number one. We as developers had to articulate that perspective and interpret what their vision was. We're partner number two. Um, Stantec and our design team, Perkins, um, are um, the implementers who are going to um, show us the visual elements of this vision. And the fourth and critical partner is you. And so ultimately, we are going to collaborate together. These um, meetings that we're having are going to allow us to do that. And it was, it's a, by example, we had the kickoff town hall meeting. And then meeting number one and number two that were community-based were these two meetings about the history, the culture, uh, and design of Brooklyn Village, and because that was at the top of our list. So we look forward to a great dialogue. And, uh, and after this, uh, we look forward to a good Q&A and, and hopefully have you all participating throughout this process. So thank you very much. And is Tom joining? Yes, I'm Tom. Thank you. Great to be here again. It's great to see all these blue t-shirts. This is the second Ward National Alumni Foundation. Give them a round of applause. They've been keeping this history alive for a long time. A few years ago, um, a plaque went up on McDowell Street um, honoring Brooklyn. McDowell was one of the gateways to that neighborhood. And um, it's important to honor that neighborhood for many reasons, but the uh, most uh, a uh, heartbreaking one is that Brooklyn is pretty much not there anymore physically. Uh, the area we're talking about is the area where Brooklyn used to be. Herbert Newell took that out as the, the county put together the package saying, let's redevelop part of this land. They said that one of the things, in addition to having affordable housing and having parkland and, and a number of other uh, requirements, was that attention be paid to history and to the people who lived in that neighborhood back in the day. And I'm a historian. I've worked for uh, the Historic Landmarks Commission studying older neighborhoods in Charlotte. A lot of that is online at www.historysouth.org. Um, and then most recently, many of you know me as the staff historian for many years at Levine Museum of the New South. I've retired, but it allows me to do more of, of this kind of history out in the community. So um, let me find my advancer thing. Do you, do you want to, you do, ah, there we go. I got one of those high tech ones, that's great. Um, I, I wrote a book about how Charlotte got segregated called Sorting Out the New South City and looked at the rise of multiple African American neighborhoods. Brooklyn was not the only one. Um, we are out here uh, just beyond Washington Heights. We have some Washington Heights folks in the audience. Uh, Biddleville around Johnson C. Smith, the Greenville, there was even a little neighborhood in Fourth Ward, pretty big neighborhood in First Ward, Third Ward. Um, all over the place, Cherry. But the Brooklyn neighborhood is the area pretty much bounded by 4th Street here, by Brevard Street there, and by what's now the I-277 loop here. And it was the, the largest African-American neighborhood. It was the one that had many of the institutional centers, uh, business centers, churches, um, the, the, the main schools were there early on. And so that's, that's what I want to share with you. Um, the, Wealth of that neighborhood is something that I think white leaders did not grasp. Um, when urban renewal happened in the 1960s, it was a time when African Americans were forbidden from most voting. Uh, there were no African American elected officials. There was, there was no voice. And the people who made the decisions did not have to listen, did not know how to listen. And they miss things like uh, the home of J.T. Williams on Brevard Street. J.T. Williams came here as a teacher, became one of the first licensed black doctors in the South, founded a number of businesses, including the Queen City Drug Company, we'll see that in a moment, um, helped build this cooperative office building called the Mecklenburg Investment Company building, helped um, uh, build Grace AME Zion Church. And, um, of Brooklyn, about all that's left physically that you can see is the wonderful architecture here by the black architect W.W. W. Smith 
and the, the Grace Amy Zion Church next door. Smith was a brick mason by trade before he became an architect, and uh, you can see his handiwork in both of those places. There's also the old Macquarie YMCA, which is owned by um, the um, United Way. Um, and both of those are outside of the area that we're talking about here, but I just want to give you a, a sense of, of the richness of life in Brooklyn. Um, here we are on 2nd Street, what's now Martin Luther King Boulevard, and this photo uh, surfaced through the Charlotte Observer just recently. It is just amazing to me to walk down the street. There's the Queen City Drug Company, J.T. Williams uh, organization. This is the old um, Afro-American Mutual Insurance Company that was built by W.W. W. Smith. You go down the street, there's the Lincoln Theater, there's the Black Public Library. Um, it was an amazing place. And what was important about it, I think, for the work that's going to be done, Brooklyn will not be recreated. That's not the plan, it's not possible, it's probably not what we want today, but what we do want is to learn the lessons of what was good in Brooklyn. And what was good in Brooklyn was it was walkable. It was a neighborhood for people of all economic levels, and you could walk where you need to go. And that is what young people today want. I've got a daughter who's 23. She doesn't own a car. She wants to walk where she wants to go. And so that is one of the lessons that you can see here. The Afro-American Mutual Insurance Company, in some ways, reminds me of Don Peebles. It was a, a little tiny organization compared to the, how many billions you are up to now, but um, th there you go. Um, but um, it was the same notion that um, an Afro-American insurance policy by an Afro-American agent made by Afro-American clerks on an Afro-American husband, an Afro-American wife, Afro-American child, mm -hmm. makes an Afro-American home independent. And I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but one of the tragedies of the old Brooklyn redevelopment was that African-Americans did not take part in decisions, but they also did not take part financially. And this is something that's going to be very different, I believe, in this, this newest thing. And this is, by the way, Afro-American, you think that's a 1970s term? 1915, that's when this book was published. On Brevard Street was the uh, first black public library in North Carolina, the Bar Brevard Street branch of the public library. Uh, there you can see it with the Afro-American, um, I'm sorry, with the um, Mecklenburg Investment Company building in the background. Um, and there is the AME Zion Publishing House, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, started up in New York. Um, today, the headquarters are here in Charlotte, and one of the reasons for that is that the denomination was very strong here and had its publishing house here uh, from the, t the turn of the last century. And indeed, when most of Brooklyn was demolished, the AME Zion Church was able to retain that site across from the NASCAR Hall of Fame and they had a new publishing house there for many years that folks can remember. Down the street was the Meyer Street School. Uh, there had been Freedmen's Bureau schools here, but this was the first school that was built, purpose-built for African-American children. And the stairways on the exterior of that are the inspiration for the angled um, decorations on the side of the Harvey Gantt Center. Uh, this was called the Jacob's Ladder School. And you can see the folks uh, climbing, climbing to economic opportunity there. It's where the uh, aquatic center is today. Right next to it was Second Ward High School. And uh, when you talk about a second, when I heard there was a Second Ward National Alumni Foundation, I went, say what? Um, but it really was anyone who came out of this community, African American person who went on to leadership in Charlotte or beyond for a number of years came through Second Ward. West Charlotte didn't exist for a number of years. And so this school was, was very important, not just as an educational facility, but also as the center of the community. Um, and um, this is a, a photograph that I love. There is Vermel Diamond in 1948, that's not right, 1948, and she was the homecoming queen. Now, now, you're giving away, some people don't know this, but she's with us today. Vermel Diamond Ely, wave your hand. Now give her a round of applause. Churches. Um, I, I don't think there's a complete c 
count of how many churches there were. There were at least a dozen. And um, some of them were big and impressive. This is St. Paul Baptist Church. You all know it in the Belmont community. That's the original um, St. Paul Baptist in Second Ward. Number of other churches, uh, the United House of Prayer for All People, the Mother House for North Carolina was on McDowell Street, Brooklyn Presbyterian, Ebenezer Baptist, uh, many others as well. And housing. Uh, this was a neighborhood that was for people of all economic levels. And that is another thing that is part of this new design that makes me excited. Because when I was coming up, there was this notion that it, a good city separated everything. Not just black and white, but rich and poor. You had a government center, you had a business center, you had a residential area. And we now know that cities are ecologies. <coughs> You can't separate the flowers and the bees. They both die. Same thing here. And so there you see um, some um, rental housing, one of the old shotgun houses, uh, grandma, two grandkids. Uh, there you see middle class housing. It's Dr. French Tyson's house. Um, the notion uh, of Brooklyn today will it not look like this, but the idea to have uh, that mixture once again. And Brooklyn had a lot of substandard housing. And that was because of policies that were set outside of the African American community. One of those policies was something called redlining. Uh, redlining is now illegal, but redlining was a, a very common practice. It was the notion of drawing a red line around a neighborhood and saying, that's a bad neighborhood. We're not gonna, we're not gonna make home loans there. Now, if you think about that, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't make home loans to people who want to buy a home, you're going to have a lot of absentee landlords that don't care about the neighborhood. And there is Brooklyn, and you can see it's red. Myers Park was green. Dilworth was green. Brooklyn was red. And so when it came time for this federal program, and a whole bunch of programs, actually, that are called Urban Renewal altogether, um, they, they targeted blighted neighborhoods. What was a blighted neighborhood? Well, it was one with a lot of absentee landlords. It was one with mixed use. That was so, said to be a bad thing. And in every American city from the 1950s into the 1970s, black neighborhoods were demolished. And here you can see that neighborhood coming down. Take a look at the, the, the official on the bulldozer there. How much would that house be worth today if that was still standing in the center city? Bobby Drakeford, how, 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 how much would that one go for, do you suppose? 400,000, there you go, there you go. So, um, so the, the notion was that it was slum clearance. Uh, Dick Gregory, I think, the comedian said it really well. He said it wasn't urban renewal, he said it was Negro removal. And I think that is actually true. So here you can see that, that area, and the area that the county is looking at is a small part of that, uh, not the entire Brooklyn area, but using that name, honoring that legacy. Here is an aerial view in the 1970s after everything came down. There's McDowell Street, a couple of office towers. There's Tryon Street. That was the whole skyline back then. There's the Bob Walton Plaza. That's one of the parcels. This is the, the site where the schools were, where the aquatic center is. There's the Ed Center, which is coming down. And this is some more of the site here next to Marshall Park. Um, and there's the, the uh, First Baptist Church, just to orient you. But you can see how empty a site it was for many years. And the idea today is to begin to fill it back in. Thank you. I am supposed to next introduce um, someone who knows this history firsthand. Uh, Ruth Sloan is someone who has been a hero of mine for a long time. When I first came to Charlotte in the 1980s and 1990s, she was writing plays about this community's history. She wrote a play about Remar Bearden for the Mint. Uh, she wrote a play about Second Ward and its cultural figures. Um, and she's worked for WTVI. She helped found the Afro-American Children's Theater here in Charlotte. And, and on and on and on and on. Um, but she, um, even though she grew up in the Greenville neighborhood, 
Um, she remembers Brooklyn firsthand because her father was one of those architect builders um, whose uh, house in Brooklyn was a place that you came and you admired his handiwork there, but you also admired it at the, the courthouse downtown. He did the ceilings in the courthouse? No, but there you go. House was in he, oh, his house was in Greenville. Okay. Yeah. But she's got, she's got uh, connections into Brooklyn. Messed up my great introduction. Ruth Sloan, <laughs> help me out of this. Hi, how are you all? Hi. I'm getting myself together. Um, for those of you who were here yesterday, my daughter was here to read with me, and today she can be. So I'm introducing Mr. Jermaine Nakia Lee, a very active thespian in our community. Well, the play is called The Second City. I wrote it because Theater Charlotte commissioned it. And when I wrote it, when I told them yes, I didn't know I was gonna meet Vermel and Price. Would you please raise your hand, Price? Let everybody know <laughs> that you were here. And on um, Cortina Perkins Simmons, whose name I couldn't remember. But also um, Reverend de Granville Burke, who was the professor at Johnson C. Smith University, and his wife, Maddie uh, Burke. He wrote this book. He was one of the five people in my nuclear group with Price and Vermel. I interviewed 30 people, but he and his wife, Vermel and Price and Cortina, were that nucleus. And the, I understand at the Second Ward House, you have this book on Brooklyn for sale. So a lot of the photographs are in there. No, you can't have mine, I'm watching it. <laughs> People have been taking it, and I'm surely gonna keep it. But we're talking about culture, and culture comes from within, from within the heart. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a celebration of culture, where people are celebrating their culture. You feel such a wonderful energy because it's a part of who they are. Even though they don't talk about it, they never ever take time to tell you what culture really means to them. But it is so wonderful, it vibrates. And that's what happened in Brooklyn. That's what happened really in all of the black communities that urban renewal tore down. And people who worked in Brooklyn didn't necessarily live in Brooklyn, but they were a part of that culture. And it was alive and vibrant. And I think the aliveness and the vibrant vibrance of the community can be saved with this project. See, when Brooklyn was torn down, 10,000 families lived in that community. It's not, that's not a count of individuals who were not a part of a family. And there were many there, but documentation shows that 10,000 families had to move. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. So the way this village is being constructed is going to draw people back into that area. We need the people because Brooklyn was about people and the warmth and the energy of good people. Also, well, we had some people that weren't so good. <laughs> it really, really we did. And because you know there's no first street in Charlotte anymore. We don't have a first street because in sociology books, first and McDowell became known as the murder corner. 
Uh huh. Yeah, a lot of tragedy took place there. So they said, okay, we're going to wipe this out. There'll be no more First Street. So it starts at Second Street, okay, not First. But the upward mobile people, the people who cared, made this a community for all of us to remember. Every morning, especially during the fall and spring, you could hear a song being sung all over Brooklyn. Oh, but a beautiful morning. Strong male voices soloing over the hill, down, round, by Miss Lenore Greer's house, an acapella serenade weaving and winding its way through the streets. Uh-huh, and back alleyways, around corners, and through rose gardens, traveling just a step ahead of the milkman, making pop calls in old kitchens, firing up stones for hot morning biscuit, biscuits, and I would listen. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Just listen. You see, I wouldn't hop out of bed right away because this song has sort of become an, my alarm clock. So I would just wait. I would wait, lying low, snuggling under the covers until I heard other voices chiming in, mint and pigeon harmony at the crack of dawn, donning a new air of happiness we could see on our faces. Oh, I didn't realize it at the time, but the little community that some call Black Bottom would become the home of most black folks in Charlotte, doctors, lawyers, artists, fine cooks, domestic workers, well-established businessmen, ministers and educators, the holy to the profane, came to settle in Brooklyn around the time, around the time close to the war between the states. A time when Brooklyn was mostly open land to the south, on the outskirts of the city lined with stately homes of some of Charlotte's first white families who built living quarters that's homes for our people who worked in their homes. Well, as time went by, the owners left and our story began, the educated and uneducated, the poor and the well-to-do did their part in making, in, in helping to make Brooklyn, or Second Ward, a self-sustaining city within a city. So you see this story about a people's place, Third Street, Fourth Street, Myers, and McDowell, the heart of a place a place that by the time they got to tearing it down, many called it a ghetto. But to us, it was home, a place where people, caring people, took care of people, and other people's chaps better not get caught doing wrong. Aunts, cousins, to no relation at all, would set a chap straight if they did that at the drop of a hat. Oh, no, 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 no talking back, uh-uh. <laughs> no matter who you belong to, no talking back. And uh, before we go on, I want to tell you that um, during this part of the play, we talk about Madam C.J. Walker. And Tom, you talked about people coming from everywhere. Madam C.J. Walker came in and trained people how to press and curl. And we had the certificate that um, Vermel's mother received, grandmother. grandmother received from Madam C.J. Walker, okay? So it was an important place for people from all over would come um, into the city. So from the end of the Civil War era until 1898, when Jim Crow began, African-American life flourished, and citizens of Brooklyn, like Dr. John Taylor Williams, played a monumental role in bringing progress to the door of the Queen City. Yes, and in 1882, Meyer Street, the city's first black grade school, opens 
with Dr. Williams as its principal. Twice he was elected to the Board of Aldermen for the city of Charlotte, and in 1898, Dr. Williams was named U.S. Consulate to Sierra Leone, West Africa, by President William McKinley. There he served until 1907. And in 1882, Mr. Chat, Mr. Thad Tate opens a barber shop that prospered for more than 60 years. He was president and co-founder of the African American Insurance Association and served on the board of trustees of the Colored Library located on Bavard Street. And in 1898, there was a phenomenal coup. Mm. <laughs> yes, it was. The AME Zion, the AME Zion Publishing House moved to Charlotte, making the city the center of religion, second only to New York City. And the star of Zion was being published in Brooklyn. As a matter of fact, it was rumored that that's how Brooklyn got its name, from the New Yorkers moving into the area to work at the publishing house. Also in 1893, Second Ward resident W.R. Holden became the last black elected to city government until the 1960s. And in 1896, Colonel Taylor, the first black colonel in the United States Army, was named second in command of the 3rd North Carolina Infantry, an all black unit formed for fighting the Spanish-American War. At the turn of the century, our lives bustled with excitement, bustled with excitement, building a new community in the heart of a relatively young city. And the city soon became known as the city of churches as Brooklyn unfolded, becoming a center for spiritual life. Bringing together cross-section of denominations, many of the black churches in Charlotte were originally founded in Brooklyn. Grace Amy Zion, Ebenezer Baptist Church, St. Paul Baptist Church, the United House of Prayer for All People. Keep going. New Emmanuel Congregational Church, Friendship Baptist Church, and Williams Tabernacle. East Stonewall AME, Brooklyn Presbyterian, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Oh, and there's Shiloh Baptist Church, Greater Bethel AME Zion. And happy Sunday mornings with overflowing congregations in edifice of genius. The first Baptist church in the spirit of love, it was truly a time of giving and caring. It is said that women right out of slavery from Brooklyn came to other black communities to watch over the members of First Baptist Church. They became stellar examples of all women in many different denominations. By becoming lamp holders, keepers of the light, holding lighted lanterns, and bringing baskets of food to the construction sites of the new church for the men who worked during the night. Well, that's it. That is the excerpt of a 95-minute play. And Tom, the next thing that would happen is we would go up Jacob's Ladder and the enormous green structure that they called the school. But everybody knew that it was plain old Maya Street School. And we thank you all. So we're a little out of sequence here, but I wanted to point out something that um, Ruth said to me uh, yesterday that I want to acknowledge and thank her for, and I, and I hope we're ultimately able to see this through. 
uh, together, and that is her willingness to see the second city presented in its totality um, at such time as we, we wrap up the Brooklyn Village project, which is an offer she made yesterday, and I want to acknowledge that and, and thank you for that gesture. So thank you very much. I'm going to introduce uh, Craig Lewis. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, my name is Craig Lewis. I'm with Stantec. Like Monty, I came here about 28 years ago. Had the great blessing to have five children born at Carolina's Medical Center. Mm -hmm. When I came and first saw Marshall Park, I wondered what was going on there. What used to be there? What was the, what was the story behind it? And as we sort of dug in and learned a lot more about what was going on, we knew and we now know all collectively there was a rich history. And there always is. You don't have to you know, dig a little bit underneath to find out what was going on. And so my job, and I think I've got one of the best jobs in the world, because a lot of what I do is go back in and help to heal, help to repair, help to renovate, um, and help to bring opportunity back to places where we've lost um, some hope. And I think that the opportunity with this project perhaps can bring a little hope back and certainly restore some memories. You know, and it's the, in many ways, it's the hole in the donut. We see a lot of things going on up on Tryon Street, up Stonewall Street, the Romare Bearden Park. We saw great things in Midtown, down Stonewall, down in that area. Um, and so now is the time. And so people have been wondering, we've been talking about this for 20 years. Well, it, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for it to be right. So we think the time is right to be able to do that. Um, and we're building not just for today, but we're really building for the future. And as, as Don said, this is a 10-year project just to, to get the bricks and mortar built, but we hope that this is a 100-year project to build the next set of memories and the next generation of memories for the children and the grandchildren of folks who will be able to pass through this area and have those great opportunities to do that. And so we have lots of great opportunities that we've seen today. Now, I know many of you all have seen this presentation before. I should turn the mic over to you. Let you all tell us a little bit about this project and what's been going on what we're proposing. But you know, this is a vision. And the, the vision is to bring people back. And that's really, if you can apply nothing else, it's all about bringing people back to this area. People of different colors, people of different ages, people of different backgrounds. And so we're gonna do what we can to be able to bring that mix. It's not something that's gonna happen organically on its own. We're gonna have to be very um, intentional about what we do with that. And so we're trying to do that as part of this vision and as we talk to you all, trying to get some more of those ideas about how we can be intentional about building that neighborhood back in, into the area. On the south side, as many of you all know, we have two sides. So we're straddling both sides of where Second Ward High School was. That's our anchor point. On the south side, we have Stonewall. Lots of great things already going on Stonewall. So really, we're just filling in the holes. And you all can see some of the great things that are going on. But that also gives us an opportunity to kind of give us a little bit of a, a back, a little bit of a wall to the busyness of the, the freeway and help to provide some great opportunities within the neighborhood itself. So along our back side, we know we're going to have some bigger buildings. And the architecture is such that it's going to be a little bit bigger because it's, it's on a busy road in that area. Um, but all along, it's helping to fill in these buildings are all under construction today. This one was just announced a couple weeks ago. And so these are the buildings that we're talking about today, all filling in along Stonewall. This is the Metro School and the Second Ward Gym. And there's Mac, now Olympic gold holders uh, going through that. What a, what a fantastic resource that we have right in this area. So one of the things that we want to mention, as I mentioned earlier, is that you know, along 277, that's our back. But we also want it to be a prominent gateway. As people are coming in, they're coming in and see, see something that's significant. And we've got some great um, towers in our community that are part of our wonderful skyline that we all cel celebrate. We want to be able to add to that over time. So our wonderful gateway building is more highway oriented. But as we turn around on the backside of that along Stonewall, it becomes more people-oriented. 
So cars on one side, people on the other. And the one other thing I want to point out is that while we're still working on what the architecture is going to be on all these buildings, we know that we want to have a great mix within every building. And so every building will have opportunities for shops. Every building will have places for people to work, have offices. Every building will have a mix of housing. And one of the commitments by this team is that we're going to have workforce housing not in one building in the corner, but spread all throughout all of the buildings, all throughout. And so that's a commitment that we want to make so that the person who's on this balcony may make half or less of the person that's on the balcony right above them, but they all have the same right to look on the great street and be able to live up and down that area. And we work to the, what we call the northern side, um, Brooklyn Village North, um, Third Street on one edge, okay, McDowell on the southern side, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard on the other edge, and we're right behind the First Baptist Church. So that area, we think we've got a really great opportunity to great, create a great park, a really noble park, and a park that has some great opportunities to restore some memories um, along with some of the other public spaces, as well as build a lot more buildings that are not big buildings like they had originally envisioned in urban renewal. The whole, the whole point of that was clear out all those small blocks where people used to live and walk and create big blocks for big buildings. So as Tom mentioned, we realized that was a failure, that people want those small blocks. They want to be able to see from one edge to the other. And they want, to, they want a park where they can play in and do lots of different things in, and that there's activity around it. Right now we know Marshall Park doesn't work because there's no activity around it. So we want to provide a park that actually has activity around it all the time. Good activity. So you can see down 2nd Street, Lots of opportunities for new stores that edge the park space. And these are big uh, shop spaces and small shop spaces. And again, to be intentional about it means we're not just going to look for these big national franchisers and just bring them in, you know, all the entire street. We want to weave them in to create a tapestry up and down that area. And I'm sure Don will talk a little bit more about some of those opportunities later. When we look down 2nd Street, you can see the new park space, um, and you can see opportunities again to be able to sit out on the street to enjoy the beautiful weather that we have here in Charlotte um, most of the time, except for this afternoon, a little hot out there today. Um, and enjoy just a great walk in the park. And we're gonna, we really want to get some feedback as to what that park needs to be over time. You know, how do we landscape it? How do we put par um, incorporate public art as a part of that? Um, what are the things that we can do, what we call programming, the different activities that occur for all kinds of people? Um, some are more informal, some are more formal um, over time. And so it's all about telling the story. And I want to invite Mani to come back up because I think there's a very significant idea that's been pushed through that he's felt very strongly about from day one. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Still, oh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, so this is Myers Passage, and I just, uh, Zena Howard's not with us today for those of uh, you who were with us yesterday, and I just want to acknowledge uh, Zena in her absence as a, uh, a woman of uh, just tremendous accomplishment. She is the uh, principal architect for the National Museum of African American History and Culture on the Mall, uh, associated with the Sm uh, Smithsonian Institute, and um, we're just, so proud to have her on the team and the quality of the of the talent that we have revolving around around this development is just uh, outstanding and certainly Zena is a big part of that. So Myers Passage um, really is derived from the old street grid and when we were looking at this very early on and just want to quickly acknowledge Scott Fuller who helped me with an early map that I put together sitting over here on the far side on the in the very first week or two he Help me put some stuff together that you'll find on the internet. You're not going to find in these slides, but it's a uh, an old uh, Sanborn map stitched together from several maps, and it has a Google aerial laid in on top of it. And it's pretty fascinating because you can identify 
Ebenezer Baptist, Friendship Baptist, the, the United House of Prayer on McDowell Second, the Alexander House Funeral Home, the elementary school, the high school, it's all there clear as day and that was very instructional for me. In fact, when I met early on with, uh, with Vermel, and uh, we were talking about the opportunities that, uh, you know, what, what are these opportunities for engagement? How do we get people involved? We talked a little bit about naming streets. And when you look closely at our plans, you'll see we only, we only named 2nd Street because it lays right where 2nd Street was, so that seemed obvious. There are some new streets, uh, and um, we were talking about the idea of getting folks involved to name some of these streets. And I mentioned the idea. I said, well, you know, there's, you know, do we use Watkins Alley? Do we use Bell Court? You know? And she said, well, don't use anything with alley in it. <laughs> and uh, so I suspect, uh, I suspect that resonates with some folks. That, uh, it certainly did with uh, Ms. Ely, and she, she set me straight on that, not to, not to incorporate the word alley. So, um, yeah. So, uh, so that's a fond that's a fond memory from early on. So, Myra Street is interesting because it runs all the way up to First Ward. It connected First Ward, of course, and and ran on down through what we're developing down to Boundary Street and down over the hill to the creek that ran down to Pearl Street Park. So, it struck us as an opportunity um, to really pull these two areas together. When you walk through this area, it's interesting that Myra Street still presents itself in a lot of ways. It's there, but you have to look for it. Um, it goes right through the civil courts building. There's a glass atrium even in the prison that is right over, uh, right over Meyer Street. And then you pick up on the other side and Meyer Street picks up right on the far side again. So the park, Meyer Street, and the development more generally, each of those is an opportunity to work with the community and figure out you know, what, do, what do we do with these opportunities? What do we do in the park area? What do we do along Myers Passage? Of course, Myers Street ran right between Second Ward High School and Myers Street Elementary. Um, and uh, what do we do with the development more generally, right, across the entire site? And we think there's a lot of different types of opportunities to do the work that we need to do around honoring the history and, and culture and so on. We do have parks and open space uh, sessions uh, dedicated going forward. Um, you know, we continue to hear from, from artists uh, who are interested in being involved in those conversations. Uh, look forward to that. Um, and I just want to put some emphasis on getting involved uh, with this type of thing and getting your thoughts to us, either through the questionnaires that we circulate uh, or online or in Q&A, all of which is being recorded. Uh, we'll appreciate having your feedback. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Craig. Thank you, Monty. And I just, to, to wrap up, um, the idea is about connecting the community back. And as Monty mentioned, Myers Passage is so important because it's there. And we feel so strongly about the fact that it has to be exactly where it was. Otherwise, don't do it. It has to be exactly where it was. And, and it's all about providing connections. So connecting back to the past, also connecting to what's present today and ultimately into the future. We know we're not that far away from Midtown and the Little Sugar Creek Greenway um, and Pearl Street Park and a lot of the other great things. It's a short walk. And so one of our challenges also is looking for opportunities to make that walk a whole lot nicer. We know right now going underneath that Stonewall Street Bridge under 277, not a fun place to be. Um, so we wanna work with our partners, the county and the city and others to be able to make that a, a better place and connect all of those different parks and all of those different places over time. So I'm going to invite uh, Don up and we're going to go into a uh, Q&A session now where we hear from you and answer questions. Uh, we will be appreciative if we can get uh, some feedback on these ideas specifically, but feel free to uh, bring forward any, any thoughts at all um, that you may have. Um, and just to explain a little bit about how this will work, so I'll be coming around with the mic. Um, the mic, again, is connected to our audio. We're recording um, audio and, and video. It'll be available um, later this week on our website. So when you do respond, we do ask you to just say your name and then just speak into the microphone. Let's go ahead. Yes, ma'am. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Lightsey, and I am a 1967 graduate of Second Ward High School. And not only that, this is more of a comment than a question, but I think some things need to be said that aren't being said. But, um, you know, the, the, the cliche about it takes a village. And when we all lived in Brooklyn and everything, you know, we were all the same. Uh, there wasn't a, a, a little you and a big I. And that's because we all had been together from all our lives, our parents, our grandparents. So I'm, I guess in a way my question is, we're bringing in now, which is I guess no other way to do it, than to bring in a group of different people from different backgrounds, different cultures, how can we, other than, I guess, through the, the help of the Lord, really get that feeling of community? That's what you want it to be, because Brooklyn was a community. And I could go next door and buy, borrow a cup of sugar, didn't even have to know them, you know. But I didn't feel afraid or whatever, and I didn't feel paranoid. So how can we bring this much that difference that uh, well you know the word I'm trying to say into this community and let it be a village of love and of concern rather than just making big money and big period pretty buildings and this person doesn't make enough money to stay in this building and that person doesn't make too little to stay in this building you know what I'm saying you know um, Brooklyn Village was no different than uh, the little towns that uh, my grandparents grew up in and the city of Washington that my mother grew up in and the little town my father grew up in in Emporia, Virginia, um, they were all um, in the era of segregation. So segregation back then was based on race. And so it didn't matter what your economic um, level was um, in those days, it was race that defined it, even though we were in a capitalistic country. And so as we advanced through the civil rights movement, uh, segregation ended, and we all got to live wherever we could afford to live. So what that did, of course, is it took the, um, the cross-section of economic and educational diversity from uh, communities like Brooklyn Village, and it dispersed it, because all of a sudden, doctors and lawyers, accountants could go and live, and other professionals and business people could go live wherever their money, in many places, wherever their money uh, could take them. And so they did. And so that's the country that we live in today. The country we live in today, unfortunately, um, precludes a larger number of African Americans from being able to go and pick where they, w and we want to live because of economic disparity. So the lack and the remnants of segregation um, are still remain, and that is economic disparity. And so part of what we're trying to do here is, because we're all, everybody lives in Charlotte other than probably me and uh, my team, but um, you know, Charlotte is a city. That's a community. And so our job in terms of this development is to create an environment that provides true opportunity for everybody and so we have affordable housing um, component in our development um, and by the way that is not targeted just for minorities that is targeted for workforce housing and we have also you know other pricing of housing that will be there and we're going to be looking to attract a diversity of people there um, look there's some very positive things that worked uh, that were the result of some horrible conditions in our country, segregation, um, and Jim Crow forced us to unite. And so today we live in an environment that we are not as compelled to unite. And so we all have to unite as a community. And that's part of what we're going to do here and make it so that the way we're going to honor um, the memory of Brooklyn Village is through respecting its culture, um, bringing in the cultural arts. Um, we're going to have um, visual displays of of, of what the community was, but also we're going to honor what 
people who lived in Brooklyn Village dreamed about. They didn't dream about staying in Brooklyn Village and continuing through segregation. They dreamed of having equal access to opportunity for their children and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren. And so this project's going to fulfill that promise. Good afternoon. My name is Gwendolyn Lucas, and I am both a second ward graduate, also living in Brooklyn. I don't know how many people are here, but I actually lived on Second Street. I see this project as being a God sent project. It is something that we have wanted for a long time. We may not necessarily get our school the second ward back, but it's going to carry that name in various ways. And I know that these guys that are working here, they're here because they're here to help everyone. And we want it to be a community or a Brooklyn village where there is so much love, so much compassion, so many opportunities that we won't even remember the Brooklyn that was torn down. I believe that it can happen. I believe that it's going to happen. So if each and every one of us here would just take a look at ourselves and just say from this day forward, we're going to be walking in love for this project, everything will be good. Uh, Dorian Carter with On Point Partners. Um, I have a question. I'm a commercial real estate firm, but I have a question around uh, and what you don't see a lot in, in neighborhoods and seems like an opportunity. What is the idea about how to get uh, certain retail businesses and as well as uh, uh, other businesses that will occupy the office space? What is the thinking around how uh, the goal to, to reach and really how you planning on uh, doing that or achieving that goal? Thank you. Can, can you repeat your name, please? Uh, Dorian. 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 Thank you, Dorian. Um, so we have a couple sessions coming up, one that's point, uh, pointed at minority participation uh, that um, uh, where we will reach out and uh, hope to get folks pointed in the right direction on where uh, opportunities exist around the 270 280 million dollars worth of opportunity that uh, we have directed uh, towards MWSBE investment um, the uh, it's a 35 percent commitment of gross costs that we've made as part of our presentation and I think the response from certain county commissioners is not only did did they not see that from our competitors but that they'd never seen that ever before on any project Don's company has uh, a tremendous amount of experience seeing those types of uh, those types of commitments through um, as a um, as a value system matter. I am interested in uh, in seeing that happen, and, and we're going to work on that together. I think uh, you also ask about the retail opportunities, and and that's going to be tricky. I mean, we we have a, a number over 200,000 square feet of retail, uh, but we've said out loud before, and I think can say out here out loud here again that we're going to be trying to figure out how do we make some of the that space affordable for the entrepreneur, um, create uh, you know this affordability thing. It, it, you know, it's always smacks of subsidies, right? So how let me say instead, how do we create opportunity for folks who might not otherwise be able to open at that location, open at that location. You know, maybe we're working with the city, Charlotte Center City Partners, others to come up with ideas on how we, how we tamp down those numbers, uh, how we otherwise support young businesses and so on to get going in some of these spaces. I'd be lying to you to say that we have that figured out. We're, we're, we're not here because we have all the answers and, and we're just going to act like we're getting the feedback and then we're going to go work off our answers. Um, we've had a number of things that have come to us already that are informing our process. Uh, that's going to continue to happen. And then we'll work with the county and I'm sure there'll be some holes in our in our effort and we're going to work to close those holes working with any number of individuals and agencies and so on to try and and, and thread the eye of the needle I like to say you know that supposedly impossible notion that you can you can do something where the sponsors make a few dollars but you end up doing the right thing at the end of the day so uh, hopefully that that gets just where we need to go you want to add yeah, to that I do um, I you talked about retail specifically. By the way, first of all, 
there is this perception, and it's prevalent throughout the country, that to provide equal access to opportunities for women and minority entrepreneurs costs more money. Well, it doesn't. Um, actually, it can result in better profits um, more often. Um, so we're approaching it from that mindset, first of all. Um, but there are a couple things that we're going to do um, to make retail um, opportunities more accessible to entrepreneurs and small business owners. Um, and that is we're going to make smaller spaces. There are going to be some larger spaces, but there are going to be some smaller ones. Um, we're also going to be receptive to doing build-outs for tenants that have good ideas that may not have the credit worthiness yet to do it because they're early on. And if we like the concept, we will do that. We have done that in many of our projects around uh, the country. And uh, just to give you a close on this, the first building we built, we delivered it in 1989. It was in this area called Anacostia. Um, we had um, four retail tenants. Um, and one of them was Nations Bank, which is now Bank of America. They're still there. They've been there throughout the duration. And then we had a beauty salon. We had, a, um, I think, a professional services and a um, convenience store. They were all new businesses and they're still there today. So we'll figure out ways to do that, but they'll be private sector focused. To where, and by the way, they pay us rent. They pay their rent on time. They perform for us. We've made money and they've made money. So that's the approach uh, you know, that we're gonna take, that conceptual approach and get feedback from small business owners as to what are their impediments to getting started. Thanks. Um, this is just a fascinating opportunity here. And a, just a comment, you know, designing for economic um, diversity. Um, I think that we have the opportunity, the community, the developers, <clears throat> to create a model. You know, when you think about changing demographics in the country, I would really like to pitch the idea of you know, throughout this entire process, developing a case study that can be used elsewhere because this is a unique opportunity to really design for the future uh, with all of these diverse considerations and, and the issues that are going to, that are involved in this project, um, I think uh, have some carryover to future development. Just a comment? All right. I'll leave that, I'll leave that alone then. I'll jump on the opportunity to talk now. Ask anybody who's on the panel. I'll tell you that. But I mean, is there a, is there a, a plan to, um, through the course of this process, to lessons learned, maybe develop a case study? Because I remember thinking that there may be, you know, the issues you'll be dealing with may be clinical with increasing frequency over time as, you know, the country changes and urban areas reinvent themselves. That's already being done. So, by the way, Microphone. That, I'm sorry. That's, that's right. been done for decades in, say, Atlanta, Washington, D.C. And so what's happening is other parts of the country, like Charlotte, are changing. Also, barriers are being knocked down. Think about the barriers that women confronted, couldn't vote, um, and the barriers they had to confront to build careers and, uh, you know, bear children and take care of them as well. Think about the barriers that um, minorities, especially African Americans, have confronted. And so as those barriers have been knocked down and the remnants that pull people back go away, there are going to be greater opportunities. The reality is when we say 35 percent minority and women-owned business opportunities, we're really not doing anybody a favor. This, is a, this country we live in is a democracy. It's supposed to be reflective of the demographics of our society. All we're doing is making sure that when our ship sails, it's going to be sailing in the right direction, you know, with a seat for everybody on it, reflective of the diversity of the community. Um, Vakala, nobody in particular. I just have a, um, uh, a question. I wanted to see if you guys can go into um, how solidifying the plan and the contract, what that looks like. Like, how will we know that the conversation that's being had would be materialized into the actual plan? And I, and I expect, I respect your comments, but I do want to say that if you were promised a school, a school should be what the county is working on. I'm not talking about the developers, that's a, a completely different thing, but I don't want Charlotte natives to get used to what I've seen often 
a conversation being different, but what's actually being done is something else, and then we just forget about what the, what we discussed. And I would point to social mobility, you know, uh, as an example, we have a conversation about you know putting a, a task force together of 200,000 people that works to see that we're working on it, but what changes would be made that seems to be a culture of Charlotte where the, there's a, we, we, we turn an eye to something, we look at it, we throw money at it, it might be more training, it might be more something, but the, the, the ill is there regardless and it remains. So I'm asking about, about you guys, how do we know that you guys will be the developers, that the contract will be sealed and the feedback that we're giving will be put into the project? What does that look like? Well, one of the one of the key things to to be aware of, and and we've mentioned this before, is that we intentionally started the community engagement process before we started the contract negotiation process. The plan that was presented to the county commission in response to the RFP by these gentlemen is our baseline. So that's where we're starting from. So it's only going to get improved through this process. And as we get feedback from the community, as we share that feedback with the Board of County Commissioners and ask them to comment, react to what we're hearing, those things will be incorporated and that will be developed as the contract documents are being developed. So September 6th or thereabouts, I'm planning on going to the Board of County Commissioners in a meeting to talk to them about the contract negotiation process in an open session so everybody can hear that. And we're also going to be reporting back to them about the feedback we've gotten from the first town hall meeting and from the meeting last night and today's meeting. All of this is going to be transparent. That's why the video is being posted on the website. All of those sorts of things are being done because we want, we want everybody to see that we're doing this open book, we're doing this as partners, and everybody wants to see what's in that RFP happen as soon as humanly possible. Hello. Hello, my name is Nakisha Glover. Um, I am born and raised here from Charlotte. Um, my church actually was in Brooklyn Village. I didn't hear it mentioned. It was Clement Memorial, Amy Zion. We were moved. Um, I, have, I would like for you to uh, repeat the square footage for retail space first. That, that feels such, feels a little bit like a quiz question, so I'm hoping I'm going to get it oh, right. No, you, uh, you said it. I just wanted to make sure yeah. I got that number right. I, I called out 280, I think, but I, it may be 268. Do you have that? Two, yeah, 268, 268,000 square feet. And that's a mixture of uh, a handful of larger format stores, think uh, urban grocery formats, and then um, three uh, spaces that are as small as 800 and running up to as much as 5,500 feet before we move on to those, uh, you know, the larger uh, the larger stores. I also want to just quickly coattail on Dennis's comments because I think it's, uh, I, I don't see Dennis's response as a, as a pat response to, to your question, sir, about um, making sure that promises are kept and so on. Um, uh, it's a technically accurate res response. So, um, but I, I want you to know that we're not, the, the justice issue is not lost on us. Um, one of my very first meetings was with Tom Hanchett on this issue. And, uh, and the first question I asked Tom <clears throat> was um, how you go about doing justice in a situation like this, which is, uh, I think, an impossible notion. Um, and uh, Tom's response to me was, I think the best you're going to be able to do is to make sure that folks who were impacted are involved in the decision-making process and have the opportunity to benefit economically. So we'd like to think that we have created a process that is inclusive. And if we've not done that, uh, we're going to hear from you all that we've not done that. If the county feels that we've not done that, we're going to hear that we've not done that. Uh, and we welcome, we welcome that, that feedback. Um, and then the participation, 35% minority participation as a way of getting opportunity out the door uh, we think is meaningful. I, I'll be so reckless as to say we, we pretty much know it's meaningful as it relates to the historical performance of our competitors. So um, we're, we're doing what we can, but we have to acknowledge that it's, it's an impossibility that we, that we correct um, all the woes of the past. And, uh, there's no sense in ignoring that that's an issue, so I just, I just wanted to address it directly. 
Okay, so for my real question. Yeah. <laughs> um, the question, well, I actually have two, if you will allow me to do those two. Okay. Um, the first question um, why I asked about the retail space is that um, the conversation that I heard um, followed up was the opportunity to rent. I'd like to hear more conversation towards the opportunity for ownership, both not only for home ownership, but I'm interested in also the commercial space ownership for the community as well. Okay, well, um, look, um, traditionally, um, commercial and retail spaces are not owned by their vendors. Uh, they are not owned by their operators. They are owned um, by a developer or a property owner because the very nature of a business, the expectation is that the business is going to be successful and may grow. And so, generally speaking, more, even, even Walmart doesn't own their uh, buildings. The idea is that they are going to follow the market. They're going to go, if they need to expand, they have the flexibility to do that. And so there won't be um, any opportunities for um, uh, uh, individual retail tenants or retail operators to own the retail space. It's just not customary in the market anyway. So, um, but there will be opportunities for people to likely buy apartments um, and, uh, and, and participate in other areas economically. My name is Wanda Jones, and I am a graduate of Second Ward High School. I have heard you all say, and then I see written documentation here of 35% of minority-owned businesses, uh, but uh, you've made very little, uh, well, commitment that I have not heard about the uh, workforce or low-income uh, persons being able to live in the community. Is there a commitment on the percentage for housing? Well, we have various degrees of um, affordable housing, and Monty can get into the specifics of that, but I do want to touch on uh, the other element here of your question, which is um, that the, the uh, minority contracting is designed to make it so that we have greater capacity for people to go and pay market housing. And then the idea is we also are going to have a work training program. Uh, all of our subcontractors will engage in some form or or another of an apprentice program that will take unskilled um, workers and provide them the opportunity to get skilled. And Monty, why don't you walk through the sure. levels of affordable housing that we're doing? So the, um, the requirement of the RFP was that we uh, present at least 30 units at 80% of AMI, uh, which will label uh, workforce housing, think um, firemen, teachers, uh, nurses, that type of thing. Um, and we delivered 107 units, uh, which is 10% uh, of 1,070 units that we will deliver overall under the, under the current plan. That's likely to, to move around just a little bit, I imagine, but today the commitment is 10% of the housing. One of the things that's interesting about what we're doing is that's all underwritten uh, by, uh, by the market. We, we're just electing to do that. Uh, and as a result of that, we can ensure that the buildings are mixed income so that the 80% units that are workforce are not differentiated from uh, the market rate units. Um, we uh, we uh, will explore some other opportunities with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Housing Partnership. How that unfolds remains to be seen. Um, but uh, we more than tripled what was required by the RFP and will continue to explore other options as we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, my name is Frank Manigo. I'm a lifetime resident of Brooklyn, 20 years and 10 months. And Mary and I lived on the same, on the same street. Uh, but my question is more of a design question. And I, 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 by training, I'm an environmental planner. So I'm, I'm thinking, what are plans for like urban gardens, uh, solar panels, and uh, low vegetation requirement for vegetables? And are you going to do a LEED certification for the building? Thank you. Um, it's an excellent question because one of the things that we have been exploring and, and want to explore a little bit more are these opportunities to have lots of different layers of spaces. So the little community gardens that you're talking about as well as larger places as well. Also rooftop spaces. I'm able to do it. So yeah, those are things that we're discussing as well. We've, we've talked a little bit about Lee, but we haven't landed on what we're going to do. As a matter of course, 
generally speaking, we do those whether we get them certified or not. We sort of embed that because it it's, makes good economic sense to be more energy efficient. Can you talk about your expertise there real quick, Stan Tech? Because you have a group dedicated to this, do you know? We do have a very large, we call it resilience and, and energy efficiency group that's part of it. Um, I'm a, a lead professional, <coughs> and you mentioned that. Um, so it's part of the work that we do, and it's embedded in our practice. I'm Dee Dixon with Pride Magazine, and uh, this gentleman really, um, think, I think, had a good point because I was going to say um, the questions that you have up there aren't being asked. And so I'm wondering if you have considered having some focus groups that would allow you to drill down and get specific answers because sometimes in an open forum like this, the, you know, you just go every which way, which is fine, but are you really seeking answers to those questions and you might, um, you know, get, a, get them better um, at, in focus groups? Is that a part of your program? So I think um, our program is to do what's required. Um, someone asked a question here earlier, of how are we going to ensure that uh, we deliver something that is everything we've cracked it up to be. And um, I'll point to, we have a couple projects, my company, and I know Don does too, but I don't know his projects as well as mine, that are national precedent projects that are recognized by the Urban Lands Institute for any number of reasons. It was the, it was the, it was the white paper or policy idea, the notion of uh, pursuing a case study. Um, I don't think you really need to pursue a case study. You think harder, you work harder, it becomes a case study. You just do the thinking, you do the working, and you, do, you come up with a project that is simply superior because you've worked at it harder than, than what anybody else might have worked at it. Um, I think that your observation that drilling down in a stakeholder meeting is the answer to the question. It's a great idea. We should do that. Uh, and that's the type of feedback that, that we want to get from, from other folks. Um, we had hoped uh, that by providing an opportunity to uh, write down the answer to continue to pursue the answer on the internet that platform's always open or for folks who prefer not to write but rather take the mic and just talk about it a little bit that that would inform some a good bit of dialogue but the more dialogue uh, the better so I think I think we can commit to the notion that we can get small groups together on this and find the time to work on these three questions w which we see as seminal questions when trying to get to the most ethereal elements of this project, this notion of culture and how you create a place that responds to uh, the notion of community. You know, a neighborhood is a place with a bunch of buildings and so on. And I've heard very little from the folks that I've talked to and I've talked to a lot, and it surprised me a good bit how little I hear about what it is that we presented in design. But I always hear about the notion of a people that are slowly disappearing and making sure that they are not allowed to disappear forever uh, because the story's not captured or articulated in some way. And it's with feedback from the folks who are impacted, we're gonna get to that place and, 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 and ideally push that out into this development in some way. Um, so uh, the answer is yes, we can, we, can, we can figure that out and we'll get together some stakeholder meetings on these three questions. I'm Tierra Swanson, good afternoon to everyone. So I wanted to come to this meeting today because I'm curious to hear what Brooklyn residents have said, and I don't know if you all can maybe crunch that down or Brooklyn residents can maybe respond to what they've said is the answer to the most important elements. And then I'm also curious how the design is mindful of seniors, because um, many of the people who were displaced are now seniors. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious of the walkability, if the retail spaces or the grocery stores or the restaurants celebrate the seniors that may live in that part of the community. And then I'm just curious to hear from the Brooklyn residents and or from the BK partners how Charlotteans can support this new design. Like I've only been in Charlotte for four years but I've heard about Brooklyn and I've always wondered how can I celebrate and be a part of you know what's going on with this. So. Okay well um, it's a lot. So first of all I think you're hearing from the community now. And if you come to more meetings, because we're going to have a series of these um, throughout the community, you'll hear more um, uh, from the residents. Also, there's a discussion opportunity online as well. And so I think that that, you know, you know I hope you can, you know, participate in those and walk away feeling you have a sense of what 
um, uh, people who have had a history in Brooklyn have had. Um, you know, in terms of design for seniors, of, you know, look, seniors live in multi, some many seniors live in multifamily as they get, you know, later on in life. They're a good, important demographic to any successful multifamily development. Um, conceptually, um, I don't know if you were here for the architect presentation. Were you here for that? A few minutes ago? How long, when did you just get here? When did you get here? Okay, so maybe there, there was a presentation by the design team kind of showing the, the walkways and so forth there, and we're early into that, and we'll be going out into the community um, further to engage in discussions on the design. But conceptually, it is a walkable community, um, geared towards a walkable community and a sense of community. Um, and, and that was kind of how it was presented a little while ago. Okay, I think that covers. Okay, great. Again, I'm Nikesha Glover, and I would like you all to kind of give us some insight into your internal decision-making leadership team, um, the demographics. Um, I'm, I'm just interested. A um, couple of points that I'd like you to kind of speak to. How many people in the senior leadership um, making the decisions, taking the information back? How many people are from Charlotte? Um, how many people would be in the age range of 25 to 40, 45-ish? Um, and what, what are the demographics, race and gender? I, if you can kind of speak to that, I think that would be nice to know. Okay, I'll, we can short and, Oh, and let me connect it back why that's important. Um, the question that you asked, what are the most important elements of Brooklyn? I feel that it's the people. For it to be the people, it needs to be fair representation at the decision-making table. So that's how I'm connecting it back to the question that was asked. Okay, well, um, you know, I just talked about how it was a democracy, right? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> business is not. <laughs> just kidding you, but, <laughs> but um, so, um, but it, it, it was all seriousness. Um, the decision-makers are us too. Um, uh, Conformity and the People's Corporation are co-developers on the project and Conformity brings a um, local um, knowledge base um, and they are local from Charlotte, been here a very long time, Monty um, indicated that um, in his presentation. Our company is a national company, national developer and so collectively we are the decision makers and important also is your county government is a decision maker. They get, they select who wins, which so far it's us and they will have provisions in the contract they will enforce those provisions they are hearing um, they're the ones who are sponsoring these meetings and they are hearing your county manager is here um, uh, you know, the the head of economic development um, is here you've heard um, from you know many people throughout this process they will be a part of monitoring and making decisions as well as we go along but in front so from the private sector side though it's us two so we'll do next steps Okay, so Mondi gives you the next step, and thank you. Thank you. So I think we have this room till 1.30, so when we wrap up, if you have uh, additional questions, you can try and track one of the team members down, and we'll, we'll, we'll stay as close to them kicking us out as we can, so please feel, please feel free to carry on after we wrap here. Um, this, uh, this calendar outlines some of the meetings that we have coming up. Swing around here so I can see this thing. The, uh, so we are working right now on the uh, MWSBE uh, presentation uh, that we talked so much about uh, those opportunities today and, and frankly in all of our meetings so far. So we're planning to be at uh, a building on um, Wilkinson, at, yeah, near uh, near near uh, Moorhead, and um, they called the Louisa Building. It's the old, it's the former Charlotte School of Law that was built five or six years ago. The details for these addresses and so on are available on the web. I'm going to show you the web page here in just a second. It's also on the back of your printed material, the web page, so you you have that information if you picked up a set of documents. And then on Tuesday morning, uh, we plan to be with the Tuesday morning breakfast forum. And, uh, and then just roll right into a presentation from there. We're still, still working on uh, getting that firmed up. As you can see, we show up be, uh, being at the Belmont Community Center at 11.30 on uh, Tuesday the 30th, so two weeks out from now. 
And then every two weeks uh, thereafter, affordable housing and public space, another session. Um, uh, Dennis pointed out to me earlier, thank you, Dennis, that when uh, a question came up on retail and the opportunities for uh, local vendors and small businesses and, and how they might be supported uh, in their efforts to, uh, to open a business. I think this session title, Economic Opportunity and Approach to Retail, it sounds a little designy, like maybe how we designed our retail, but in fact, it's our approach to ensuring that there's some opportunity uh, on, the, on the retail front. So uh, please keep that in mind. Economic opportunity and how are we going to do this retail piece that someone asked about earlier. Uh, and then we are scheduled to have our final town hall meeting on October 31st, or excuse me, 13th, where we will take up much of the information that we've uh, gathered and, and do everything we can to incorporate that into our plan and provide another presentation uh, at that time. Um, there's a lot of work happening between here and there, so exactly what that's going to look like uh, two months from now, I think we're going to be discovering that together. But uh, we had, I think, 150 people at the kickoff. I suspect we'll have more at the final meeting. And uh, we encourage uh, your continued participation in all these meetings. This is our Facebook page. Um, we're particularly active there, not so much on Twitter, but there's our Twitter handle if, you, uh, if that's your uh, preferred uh, communication. And then we have the, uh, the website there um, that you can use uh, as well. Again, that website is on, the, is on the back of your printed material, so you don't have to write that, write that down, that big mouthful there. Um, so we're, we're uh, t tell me again, Gwendolyn, what did you, okay. Uh, the, uh, so that concludes, that concludes our session today, and uh, we'll welcome uh, additional uh, conversation if anybody wants to uh, chat a little bit.